This is part five of addressing your answers to my question of what is your number one biggest songwriting struggle? So let's dive in. Hello, friend. Welcome to another episode of the Songwriter Theory Podcast, specifically another bonus episode where we are talking about your specific struggles, addressing exactly what you said in the survey I sent out probably at this point a month or two back. If you haven't already, be sure to grab my free guide, 20 different ways to start writing a song, songwritertheory.com slash free guide. You struggle with starting songs or feeling like your songs are all starting to sound the same. That is something to grab. It will definitely help you with that because a lot of times when we get stuck or when we just stare at a blank page and are like, I don't know where to start my song this time. A lot of times it's because we're starting our songs the same way over and over again. And having a bunch of go to's for how to start songs is a great way to go. For me personally, I probably have five or six go-tos that are some of my bread and butter ways to start songs. And then of course, I, I from time to time will use some of the other 20 different ways to start songs. But I think it's a good thing to have a few bread and butter ways that you go to most of the time. And then when those bread and butter ways aren't working, have even more options because more options is Almost always good. I guess it's not always good because there's there is such a thing as too many options. But that's the songwritertheory.com slash free guide. And with the last episode, we actually stopped in the middle of someone's answer. So we're gonna continue with that one. So <laughs> uh hopefully that person wasn't like, Are you kidding me? I I listened to all these just to hear my the answer to my struggle. And then he didn't finish it in one episode. Um, so sorry about that, if, if, if that matters to the person who submitted this answer. So we left off with sequence of story development in a song. But number three is where to find great, in quotes, ideas for writing songs. So the answer is all of the places and also great ideas are overrated. So I think all things being created equal, if your song is built off of a great idea rather than a bad or pedestrian idea, that's better. But if you have a terrible song off of a great idea or a great song a after a pedestrian idea that's been done a million times before, which one is better? the great song off of the pedestrian idea, right? Lots of great movies are not revolutionary in the basic plot or basic idea or the character, but they're executed marvelously, so they're great. And then many other movies at, at the core have great ideas and then just screw them up. And it's a terrible movie. Nobody cares how good the idea was. And, you know, same thing's true for really any art form. Uh, but movies is probably the art form that we all can most resonate with besides music. So I'd like to use those as examples and analogies sometimes. But beyond that, so don't don't over obsess about great ideas would be the first thing I would say. It's better to get the song right than the idea right. Um, specifically, you're asking though where to find great ideas for writing songs. And to me... It's about having a bunch of different pools that you can dip into for ideas. Because it's not like, I don't think there's a location where the best ideas lie waiting for us to find them. I don't think that's a thing. I do think that there's a bunch of different pools, a bunch of different places we can get ideas from. And the more ideas you get, the more likely you're going to find some great ideas. I'm not a huge believer, as I mentioned before, in the idea of quantity leading to quality. Um, at least not – I'm not a big fan of that idea in general as as just a – it's one of those things where any phrase like that is trite at some point and therefore it's not totally true. Um, but specifically, I don't know. If you write a song in an hour every day for 365 days, so a whole year – are you going to have great songs? I would say probably still not because you still wrote a song in just an hour. And most of the time, if you try to write a whole song in an hour, something's going to suffer. 
probably the lyrics the most. You might have a sweet, sweet melodies and a good chord progression or a few chord progressions. So the music in an hour long song, a lot of those might be pretty good, but almost always the lyrics are going to be probably pretty pedestrian would probably be the kind word for it. If we, that's taking the claim to the extreme, right? That quantity leads to quality. That if you just do quantity, eventually you'll get quality. So I don't think that's true for everything. I do think that it's probably more true when it comes to ideas. Because there aren't there aren't like certain sources for ideas that are better than others. So you're just better off getting as many ideas as you can. Because if you come up with 10 ideas a day, you know, that 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 would result in th over 3 th over 3500, right? It would be 300 3650 ideas in a year. That's a ton. You're not going to write even a, a one hundredth of that many songs in a year. So ideas are cheap. Gather as many of them as you can, and that's how you're going to find great ideas, is just by gathering a lot of ideas. And the way you gather a lot of ideas is to have a bunch of different pools to draw from for ideas and to just train yourself to be better at hearing and noticing ideas when they metaphorically slap you in the face so just learning and training yourself to sort of listen when people speak and hear when somebody says something that's like oh actually i know that that's my buddy tim who usually doesn't say anything insightful at all uh, i don't have a buddy tim so i'm not throwing any real person out of the bus but actually he just said something kind of profound or maybe the way he meant it wasn't profound but actually the phrase he said is like, huh, that's kind of intriguing. So training ourselves to notice that, training ourselves when watching movies or reading books to, to be looking for song ideas that we can pull out of them. Learning to people watch in a way where you're not just being creepy, but instead you watch and you're like, huh, I don't know the story of that old man and presumably his granddaughter. I don't know why it is that uh, there at the park today, but maybe I can, you know, maybe there's a song there. Maybe I can backfill some fictional story about them that resonates with me that I think is compelling. And and there's your song idea. So increasing the amount of pools that you can draw from, you're drawing from other arts, the movies you're watching, the paintings you look at, the, the books you're reading, you're pulling from, you know, if, if, Somehow you hate yourself enough to like watch the news every night or something. You pay too much attention to that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, at least get something beneficial out of it where you, you're looking for stories to, to tell or something. And training yourself when listening to people to be listening for, for ideas. Then seeking out art, right? I'm a big fan of using Google images for, you know, ocean art. And then like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Lady of the sea art. Oh, okay. Actually Medusa. That's an interesting image. Medusa art. Medusa versus Thor art. You know, you just go down a rabbit hole and eventually maybe you find some paintings that resonate with you or have a symbolism that you want to use in your lyrics. The more different way areas that you can draw from and then the more ideas you gather will lead to great ideas. Number four. Importance of counting syllables. For those of you wondering, number four, what are you talking about? To catch you up, this person gave me five different number one struggles. Uh, and we stopped about halfway through. We went through two of them in the last episode. So we're going through number three and now four. Importance of counting syllables and the type of syllables. So for type of syllables, I'm going to assume you mean stressed versus unstressed because those are the only two meaningful types of syllables. You could maybe argue that there's sort of three types of syllables because they're syllables that are kind of in the realm of you could argue they're stressed or you could argue they're unstressed. Just like there are some that are just clearly this is an unstressed syllable. Like, for example, let's take forever. In forever, the forever, the e eh is clearly emphasized right? It's not forever. It's forever. So for and ver are clearly not emphasized. But there are other words 
where you know maybe it's 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 debatable that you know one one syllable is clearly emphasized, one's clearly not emphasized, and then a third one is kind of like eh, it could go either way, right? Depending on the melody, it, it could really work either way. Um, so for type of syllables, emphasized and unemphasized are really the important ones, and then the importance of counting syllables. So I would argue that counting syllables is is not necessarily important in and of itself, but counting emphases is important. So syllables matters to a degree for sure, but it's more about the emphases. So when we talk about meter, usually when we're talking about meter, we're primarily talking about how many emphasized syllables are per line, not how many total syllables, because that is a little bit more important. Um, so trying to think of there's something more to, to say on that. So so counting syllables, good, better is counting and caring specifically more about the emphases and the emphases being in roughly the same place. So a silly example would be I want to go to school or I want to go to the school. In those cases, the syllable counts are one off, right? I added the. But in both cases, the emphases and the rough meter of it is actually kind of the same. I want to go to school. I want to go to the school. The meter is essentially the same because to and the are both unemphasized. So I I want to go to school. Three emphasized syllables. I want to go to the school. Three emphasized syllables. You could have essentially the exact same melody and fit it to either of those. The only difference is that you'd, let's say two is on a D. You'd sing D for two and the word the versus just singing it for two. And you'd cut the note in half, right? So instead of a quarter note, you sing two eighth notes or something like that. So the rhythm would change it a tiny bit, but it's, it's, it's with filler words and unemphasized words, it's not super important. Um, it's probably, all things being equal, it might be slightly better if the syllables also perfectly match, but for the most part, don't really worry about that. The main thing to worry about, does it sound natural? If it feels unnatural, like you're fitting, trying to fit in words and it feels wrong, then, you know, look a little more deeply, look at the syllables, look at the emphases. But for the most part, worry about the emphases and only worry about the syllables. Uh, a, if you find it for some reason more helpful, because sometimes I do actually look at the syllables and the emphases just come naturally with the melody. So I, I worry a little bit less about that because I know that's going to match because I'm singing the melody and I'll immediately know like, oh, I'm singing a part of the melody. That syllable needs to be emphasized, but I'm singing the wrong, right? Like, don't do that. Um, so so go by what what feels right predominantly, but emphases more important than syllables. And number of words in each bar normally. So the answer to that is there's no such thing. That doesn't really exist. I'm sure somebody could do an analysis on all songs and find the average number of syllables at, per line or something. And I would guess it's something like seven, if, if I were to guess. But that doesn't exist. I wouldn't worry about that. That's getting way too lost in the details. If it feels like your lines are getting wordy, maybe dial it back and reduce the amount of syllables. If your lines don't feel too wordy to you, good. Keep them as they are, or maybe consider adding more syllables and seeing if it, you know, get it to the breaking point where it's like, okay, now it's too wordy and then dial it back. Overall, really just don't worry about it. Uh, but, but, but to go the extra mile in the answer, as I've tried to do with all these, perhaps to some of your chagrin, there's something called common meter. Common meter is three, or sorry, four emphases in a line, followed by three, followed by four, followed by three. That's common meter. And often you have a stressed syllable followed by an unstressed syllable. As I just mentioned, you don't have to do that, right? I have to go to school and I have to go to the school. Essentially the same meter. The fact that there's two unemphasized Syllables in a row instead of one, not a big deal. But the quintessential common meter is four, three, four, three for emphases. And then the, if, if you just take the, and it's always going to be emphasized, unemphasized, emphasized, unemphasized. 
then it would be 8686, right? Amazing Grace would be a great example of a song that everybody knows that is in common meter. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, four emphases, eight total syllables. That saved a wretch like me. Three emphases, six syllables. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Four emphases, eight total syllables. And we're, we're going to cut off there because you get the point, right? <laughs> uh, so if there were an answer to that, I guess it would be 8686, eight, which would average to seven syllables per line. But common meter is not in every song or even close to every song, but it is called common meter for a reason. So take that with, uh, with what you will. So I guess maybe you could take it as if you are wildly off from seven, if you're at three for all of your songs, maybe that is a little, that's a little on the short side. If you're at 15 for every one of your songs, eh, maybe it's a little bit long, but for the most part, I wouldn't worry about it. If it feels natural, if it works with the melody, if the, if the melody feels natural, you're good. I struggle most with writing a chorus because I want it to be memorable but not annoyingly repetitive. I also find it hard to make the chorus melody stand out and sound more, quote, chorus-like. So, <laughs> because I want it to be memorable, but not annoyingly repetitive. And everybody said amen, right? I mean, that's, 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 that's the crux of a chorus right there. Um, so, so for me personally, I actually stay quite a ways away from your most stereotypical choruses. Pretty rarely in a chorus do I repeat any line. I mean, each chorus is most of the time I keep the lyrics the same for most choruses within a song. But some songs, for example, Huge Vertical Horizon song, I'll use one of their songs as an example. I'm Still Here, arguably my favorite song of all time, one of them for sure. The chorus of that is the cities grow, the rivers flow, where you are, I never know, but I'm still here. And if you're right and I were wrong, why are you the one who's gone and I'm still here? So that's one of the choruses. And they all basically follow that template of, you know, two lines, I'm still here. Two lines, I'm still here. That's very common. And I think a great way to do a chorus where it's not too repetitive, but you are spotlighting, in that case, I'm still here, which by the way is the title of the song. So that's a great way to go. Something where you have two lines and then your title line, two lines, your title line, or one line, title line, one line, title line. Those are great, great formats to go with. I personally, with most of my songs, actually go all the way to, I don't even, that's as little as you can repeat as possible, right? You have one line that you repeat where you, where you do it a total of two times. That's the least amount that you can repeat. And I usually don't even do that. Now, this is just a me thing. I'm not saying you should do what I do. I'm just throwing it out there that for what it's worth, if you think, oh, my chorus has to be, I don't know, like one of those uh, choruses that is literally just one line repeated, 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 repeated. It doesn't. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't have to be that. You can go the opposite direction completely. Um, but outside of that... A, a great way to maybe thread the needle is to do the title line twice, where you have one line, title line, one line, title line, or the two lines, title line, two lines, title line. is a great, great format to use. It's actually something I plan to use intentionally uh, a little bit more this year. I Partially because I'm a huge Vertical Horizon fan and they use that a lot. So I feel like, well, you know, if my favorite band of all time does it, maybe I should do it too. And just because I haven't done it much. So I want to experiment with it. And, you know, we all can fall into traps of doing, you know, almost all of my courses don't really repeat within them at all. So I, I don't want that to be something where, like, people just expect that. Because, like, oh, he never repeats in a course. Well, I don't want that, that to become the, the thing that I do always. Uh, if you always do one thing, that's almost always something to address. It's not necessarily a problem, but creatively, we should never just do the same thing every time. So... That's a good balance for memorable but not annoyingly repetitive, in my opinion. And I think in a lot of people's opinions, because a lot of songs follow that sort of format. 
And almost all the songs that people find really annoying, outside of songs that are just inherently annoying, like Hey Soul Sister, which is one of the worst songs ever written, or WAP, which is the worst song ever written probably. Um, outside of those, a lot of times why people find songs annoying is something like repeating four times in a row anything. I notice four times is usually where annoyance set in, sets in. Two times adds a little emphasis. Three times really emphasizes. Four times once in a while feels right. If there's one point in the song where you sing something four times, that can be great if it's once. But a lot of times where people get annoyed is it's literally the same thing four times in a row, five times in a row, six times in a row. That is usually where things get really annoying. So on the make the chorus melody stand out and sound more quote chorus like, the easy mode thing to do with this is two things. One, have it in a higher vocal range, even if it's slight. Even if it's slight, just make it so it's noticeably a little bit higher than your verses. Easy hack number one. Easy hack number two is to simply have more or bigger leaps. Don't have too many leaps. I don't want you to hear that I'm saying, oh, you should go up by a sixth and then right back down by a fifth and then back up by a seventh. No, it still needs to... Pretty much any melody is going to have more steps than it has leaps. But if your verse is almost exclusively steps, you just go from C to D to E, back down to D, back down to C. Then in the chorus, that's the time to go from C to F, and then from F to G, back down to F, down to B, or back down to C. Right, Just, just a little bit more leaps. Move in a little bit more. Having bigger leaps up with your voice or leaps down. Those are two... Easy ways to make something sound more, quote, chorus-like. It's very difficult for something to sound chorus-like if it's in the exact same vocal range as your verses. And it's especially difficult if you also don't, if you also have nothing that's particularly different or more epic about it. So at the very least, at the very least, even if you're already at your max vocal range with your verse, I would say consider moving the song down in pitch. Might be the, you know, so move it so the verses are actually lower in pitch and then write your chorus melody so that it can be higher. Because a lot of people get worried like, oh, I don't have a massive vocal range. You don't need a massive vocal range to have the chorus just be a little bit higher than your verse. Do you have a range of an octave? Okay, you can, then you can, which basically every human has. I think literally every human probably has. And a lot of you probably have even more than that. You just haven't leaned into it or maybe don't have the confidence right now, which is fine. But even if you have an octave, that's that's more than enough. If you just think in terms of fifths, you know, your verse can be from C all the way to G, and then your chorus can be from the F right below the G all the way to the C above. <laughs> and there's very little overlap, and clearly the chorus is higher overall, and that's just an octave. So you can do that. Um, so those are the two, the two tips I would give for making the chorus melody stand out and sound more chorus like I'm really having trouble figuring out what to write about. I feel like nothing interesting has happened to me and I just don't really have any stories to tell that are emotional at all, all surface level stuff. Man, there's a lot to bite, <laughs> bite into. You guys really brought it with these, with these, with these answers. I got I to gotta do more surveys more often. So much good stuff in here. So first, I would say it is almost certainly not true that you have nothing interesting that has happened to you because you're a human being presumably above the age of, I don't know, 12, 14. Statistically, you're probably in your 20s, 30s, or 40s because the vast majority of my audience is somewhere from 20s to 40s. Um, so statistically, you're probably in there, but just based on the fact that you answered this survey and you have an email and you answered this survey, you, you're almost certainly above the age of 12, something has happened to you. You might not think it's interesting because you think that the experience is something that everybody's experienced, but that doesn't make it not interesting. In fact, what's most interesting in the form of a song is something that pretty much everybody has had happened to them. In songs, usually what we want to hear is something that's intrinsically human, that we've all experienced to a degree. 
even if you haven't experienced the specifics of the song, it should be something that you can resonate with. That's why probably something like 60% of all songs are about love. And then, you know, another 10% of songs are about something life, right? Whether it's death, whether it's, you know, the joy of the birth of a child, right? That's not a love song or at least not a romantic love song. It's, it's, it's a life song or the song 100 Years, one of the greatest songs of all time, in my opinion, by Five for Fighting. That's just about, you know, dwelling on the idea of how we at best have 100 years to live. Uh, really, we don't even have that, and how how quickly sort of time goes, and 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 how beautiful it is to be young and to have the ability to choose. Because when you're 99, you're gonna look back and be like, "Wow, I, you know, at 15, I had everything in front of me, and I don't anymore." And, and the fact that he was writing that at like 33 years old, I think he was when he wrote the song, or 30 something like that. No, I guess around 33. There's nothing revolutionary about that, right? But it's intrinsically human. We all are afraid of death, almost all of us, right? E e e to at least a degree. I think that's why everybody lives their life as if they're never going to die, right? I think, I think in our heart of hearts, none of us, very few of us really believe we're going to die. Because, I mean, honestly, would, would, and I know many people like that, this, I'm 30 now. And I have friends that are in their late 20s and 30s that spend two, three hours a day playing video games. And I'm this is not an anti-video game rant, I promise. But if you spend two to three hours every day playing video games, there is a good chance that you don't really in your heart of hearts believe that you're going to die. Because I just don't think you would spend that large percentage of your free time and that large percentage of your life doing something that you know on your deathbed, like... Nobody's going to look back and be like, oh, I wish I played that video game on your deathbed, right? We all know that. And same thing's true for like workaholics with a day job, right? You work 80 hours a week as, as, a, as a, you know, so, uh, mechanical engineer or something for Honda. Are you really going to look back on your deathbed and be like, well, thank God that I missed my kids' sports games and stuff so that I could help Honda build cars? Like eh. nobody's going to say that. We, we all know this. So we wouldn't make these choices that a lot of people make if we really in our heart of hearts believe that we we're going to die. So I say all that to say that I don't know what you mean by nothing interesting has happened in your life. I'm sure that's not exactly true. And even I, I'm sure you believe it to be true. I'm telling you that as your friend, I'm sure that's not true. You're selling yourself short. Of course, you have stories to tell that would be interesting. Or would be something that would resonate with people. And a lot of what is interesting is not something that is like, oh, nobody's ever talked about that before. A lot of times if there's a song about something that nobody's ever talked about before, it's because nobody gives a crap. Right? If you think, oh, there's never been a song about Pop-Tarts. Well, that's because nobody cares about Pop-Tarts. I mean, I might enjoy Pop-Tarts, but I'm totally disinterested in a song about Pop-Tarts. Unless it's a comedy song, maybe. But there's nothing compelling about Pop-Tarts. That's why nobody writes about Pop-Tarts. I'm not picking up. This is true of any given thing, right? There's no song about Walmart because who cares? It's Walmart. I don't know. Like sometimes I, some elements of Walmart I enjoy. They own my precious Bronco. So I like that. <laughs> They're doing a good job so far. But um, so, and then I would also challenge you, you don't need to be limited by your experiences, I think this is a mistake that a lot of people make, and I think it comes from the the very often quoted "write what you know," which I have a lot of strong opinions, but that that for me is one where I'm like pretty firmly in, in the middle because I think there's truth to it, but if, but but also you're limiting yourself greatly if you truly abide by it. So write what you know in in a sense, you know, if you know something, maybe dive into that a little more deeply you know if 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 something you really know is heartbreak and you just went through a heartbreak recently take advantage of that but don't only write about the things you know because that's limiting as a creative person and a lot of times you know more than you think because even if let's say something nothing has ever happened to you ever you've never liked been romantically interested in somebody before you've never had your heart broken in any way before you've never had any loved one die 
You've never even had a friend betray you or uh, you've just had nothing interesting happen in your life. I bet you know someone that something interesting has happened to, who you care about, who you can empathize with. The first real breakup song I, I ever wrote, I had never dated someone before. My friend had a girlfriend. I was friends with both of them. He was my best friend. And she broke up with him. And again, I had never been broken up with before. And I wrote a song because I empathized with my friend, put myself in his shoes. I talked to him so I knew how he felt. And I wrote a song about it. And then three or so years later, I remember joking with my band because we had we were finishing our album and that song was on the album. And now at that point, I had recently been broken up with. So I did understand what it felt like to be broken up with. And I looked at that song and I'm like, wow, nailed it. <laughs> like, it's exactly how I feel because we're human, right? We can empathize with people. Just as one last example, let's say this already would disqualify you from nothing interesting has happened to you. But so maybe I shouldn't use this as an example, but, but, but I'll use divorce as an example. If you are somebody who your parents got divorced, you might think, oh, write what I know. The only thing I know is what it's like to be a child with mom and dad no longer live together and I have to you know, visit one and I live with one and it's not fun for anybody. No, you know more than that, right? You know bits and pieces of how each of your father and mother felt about it. And, the, and maybe the circumstances that got there, right? So you can put yourself in your dad's shoes. You can put yourself in your mom's shoes. And then even within that, to a degree, you can put yourself in your mom's shoes and play devil's advocate or, you know, against her or, or for her, right? No matter what the circumstance. If it's something where it's like your dad didn't spend enough time with the family and, and was a workaholic and didn't pay attention to your mom and then your mom eventually cheated, you, you can easily pick either point of view to a degree and tell that point of view in a sympathetic way or in a way where they're the villain, right? You can easily tell a story from your dad's point of view that's like, she's the villain. She cheated on me. I was, you know, yeah, I worked too much. I probably should have paid more attention, but, you know, it, I didn't deserve that. And then you also can write from your dad's perspective where he's like, oh, no, I asked for this based on the way I treated her and the family. You can take that view. And I'm sure your dad in this circumstance, this totally fictional circumstance that I created, your dad probably felt both things at some point. Right? He probably had a whole year where maybe he felt guilt. Like he really – he was the reason. And maybe he probably had a whole other year where he was just ticked. Like, wait a second. Yeah, I'm imperfect, but this is way worse. And then, you know, you, you can do the same thing with your mom, right? So no matter what's happening, there's so many different shoes you can put yourself into. You have so many different friends or people you know or stories you heard on the news. We have an amazing ability as human beings to empathize with other people and also to, to put ourselves in another circumstance and say, how would I feel if X happened to me? Which, by the way, is a question you can ask yourself. You can pick a situation and literally say, how would I feel if X, said situation, happened to me? How would I feel if I finally got my first significant other and they cheated on me? How would I feel if I thought I found the love of my life and then they left me for someone? That's the same thing. I don't, I don't know why I'm returning to that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I, you know, how would I feel if I were 70 years old and getting Alzheimer's and my memories were starting to go and my wife had passed a few years previously and I'm dealing with the guilt of losing the memory of the person I love, right? Just put yourself in these shoes and ask, how would I feel if? Songs don't have to be autobiographical, uh, nor should a lot of them be, really, because all of us have limited life experiences. We don't want our songwriting to be limited to our life experiences. In the same way, if you were to write a novel, you wouldn't want your novel writing to be limited to your life experiences. Science fiction and, and, uh, and fantasy wouldn't even exist as genres <laughs> if, if that was the attitude, right? Like, oh, science fiction, there is no real hover car, so we can't, you know, like, a, um, so, so songwriting should, should be in the same department. We don't need to be limited creatively. All right. We're going to cut it off there. We'll return with more in these bonus episodes. Hopefully they've been helpful. Again, if you haven't already, 
be sure to grab my free guide, 10 different ways to start writing a song. Songwritertheory.com slash free guide. Thank you so much for listening, for watching. Hopefully it's helpful to you. Hopefully it's especially helping the people that actually uh, were kind enough to take their time and respond to the survey. Thank you so much to those of you who did. And if you didn't, that's okay too, but it's super awesome. Those of you who did take the time to do it, I super appreciate it. Hopefully you are noticing the appreciation I'm showing in the form of all these bonus extra podcasts, uh, responding to every single one that I at least got in the first couple weeks. And I will see you for the next one, which at this point now I'm thinking there's going to be like 30 of these. Probably not, but <laughs> there might be closer to 15 than 10. I don't know, but I will see you or hear from you or you'll hear me, whatever. You know what I mean, <laughs> in the next one. <laughs>